Hi folks, in this video we're going to be looking at coastal processes and in particular how do the landforms contribute to the landscapes. So think about the processes that lead to coastal landforms creating landscapes. We're going to be looking at marine processes and sub-aerial processes. We mentioned these in the previous video so go back and watch that if, uh, if you're unsure about it. We're going to be looking at how marine processes, meaning waves, erosion, erosion landforms, transport and depositional landforms all contribute to the landscape. But we'll also be looking at how sub-aerial processes of weathering, erosion and mass movement also lead to these, uh, these landscapes forming. So let's start with waves. First thing to remember about waves, very similar to tsunamis, when we learned about those, is that as the wave comes into the shore, the height of the wave increases and the wave length decreases. So the waves are coming in and they're basically doing that. Wave length, shortening, and wave height, increasing. So, with this in mind, there are two types of wave that are going to create these landscapes. They are the constructive and the destructive wave. Now, constructive wave is generally up to a meter in height and can have a wavelength of up to 100 meters. It comes up a very flat beach, so often on coastal plains. It comes up a very flat beach and what happens is it just rolls over. The wave is coming in and it just kind of goes up and over onto the surface. This is because the water can travel at the same speed, you see. It all comes along as a block, and it moves up and it just goes, zoop, and it sloshes over. It's got a strong swash, so it's got strong movement in, and a weak backwash. So the movement backwards is much weaker. On the other hand, a destructive wave does pretty much the opposite. It's got a much higher height, over a metre, and the wavelength is short, normally about 20 metres, which is very short for a wave. And this one, rather than just rolling in and sweeping back, it's because of the angle that it's coming in at, a steeper angle, the bottom of the wave slows down and the top rolls over the top. So it comes up and it goes and plunges downwards. It's a plunging wave and that's a term that's often used. So it plunges down, there's a lot of energy that moves downwards and it rips back. So quite a weak swash because it's been sort of flipped over the top, crashes down and pulls back hard. So it creates these ridges behind it. So it's kind of a this dynamic equilibrium which I keep talking about. It's working both ways. The steeper the cliff profile, the more destructive the waves, which can dig out more sediment and make it steeper in terms of the beach profile. Opposite is true for the constructive waves. It keeps pushing more sediment up does it gently, it's going to build the beach. So those are our two big processes when it comes to waves. We will talk about transportation and longshore drift in a bit. Now it's worth bearing in mind that constructive and destructive waves don't just happen in one particular space they can actually happen uh, on the same piece of coastline. You might get more destructive waves in the winter, constructive waves in the summer. Uh, this is often linked into the tides caused by the moon. 
So the dynamic equilibrium doesn't just change across the coast, it can also change over time. Both time and space will affect it. So let's move on from waves to have a look at erosion processes. Moving on from waves, we have a look at the erosion itself. There are four processes of erosion, which uh, you probably know about already, but we're going to go back over them. They are hydraulic action, abrasion, attrition and corrosion. Now it's worth bearing in mind that all of these are going to be dependent to a degree on the strength of the wave. Uh, the least so being corrosion, because that's to do with the acidity of the water. But agitating the water, i.e. moving it more, i.e. stronger waves, is going to have an effect. Fetch, i.e. the distance that the wave travels, and therefore the speed it goes at. The tide, i.e. how high the tide is, and the angle that the waves are coming in at, are going to affect these four processes. Long fetch, more energy. High tide, more water to do the eroding. And a 90 degree angle straight on is going to be the, uh, the most damaging to the rocks. So let's take a look at these four processes. Hydraulic action. This is water crashing into the rocks. Air gets trapped in the cracks. The air can compress to a degree, but then it won't compress any further and it'll actually crack the rock apart because it's compressed air, it's got a lot of energy stored within it. So that's like a battering ram. Hydraulic action occurs, uh, or it's, it's more vulnerable, sorry, for uh, heavily jointed cracked rocks. So the more cracks and more joints, the, uh, the more effect it's going to be. So if you've got strata in your rock, more chance of hydraulic action. For very, very hard rocks, very tough igneous rocks, this might actually be the only erosive process going on because they're so strong. The only thing that can damage it is that pounding from the water. Abrasion is the next process. This is where smaller bits of rock are thrown by the wave into the cliff face. High tides in particular lead to more abrasion because more water, more of a wall of small particles to be thrown at the rock. Unconsolidated materials are greatly at risk. Basically, if the pieces within the water are stronger than the rock that it's being hurled at, then it's going to do more damage. If this is stronger than that, that's going to win. Attrition is where big bits of rock grind against each other to make smaller bits of rock. So it's not strictly eroding the cliff face or the coastline itself, but it's all linking into the same process and breaking it down as it goes. Again, unconsolidated rocks are greatly at risk of this. Corrosion is a chemical process, and this occurs mostly with limestone and other calcium carbonate based rocks. Chalk's another one, because it's the acid, it's the CO2 mixing with the water, carbon dioxide mixing with water to create carbonic acid that erodes the rock, hence the little beaker. Often a lot of these processes work together, particularly on limestone cliffs. The water is hurled into the cracks, dissolves it, breaks the crack a bit further, so hydraulic action can be more effective. Abrasion as bits of rock are thrown onto the limestone and it's all broken down by attrition. So they all work together. And these erosion processes lead to a series of different landforms. So the erosion processes that we've looked at lead to a series of landforms. And it's the classic um, transition that you've probably heard of the crack, cave, arch, stack, stump. But just to quickly go over that again, waves are attacking the cliffs, so a crack forms, and then crack will eventually open up 
into a cave. So okay. Got a little dark cave there, and uh, another crack will be opening up over over here. And then the cave will open up. So there we go. There's the water. Um, and meanwhile, we've got a crack that's turned to a cave here and a crack here. So this is now an arch. And eventually, the arch will. Uh, Get bigger. So the erosion is just carrying on, it's carrying on, it's working its way down until eventually, as you can probably guess, the top of the arch falls in, just leaves a stack remaining. And eventually that stack will erode down to form a wee stump. And uh, that's the classic sort of erosion landform process. However, what happens if the cave erodes upwards? Still a cave that's eroding upwards. Eventually it might form what's known as a blowhole. Whereas the wave comes in, all that water's coming in, it's run out of room, so it's being pushed upwards. It's being pushed up by pressure, up the spout, and eventually will blow out the top. There's a location um, in Cornwall, and then there's the Devil's Cauldron, where this is the case. Wave comes in, water blasts out the top, because it's a huge quantity of water, suddenly compressed down, so it just shoots straight out the top. And these are the classic erosion landforms. So the erosion has taken place, it's formed some landforms, but what about all the sediment that's being transported away? The first thing that most people who've studied coasts before will think of is longshore drift. Now just to clarify how this works, for anyone who's not uh, done it before, waves come in at an angle and they push sediment up the beach. So sediment there, it's pushed up the beach to here by the wave. Of course the wave comes up but then it also comes back so the piece of sediment drops back down. It rolls back down the beach with the wave. Wave comes along, pushes the sediment back up and the process carries on. And the net movement is that the pebble or whatever is kind of moving along the beach so it keeps moving along. Now of course this is for constructive waves uh, destructive waves have a very different approach. Uh, destructive waves just pull the sediment out and then it gets swept up um, at an area where there are constructive waves or part of the dynamic equilibrium. So all this is happening uh, on the beach. There will also be a load of sediment in the water as well. Now aside from longshore drift, which is large pieces of material, we need to think a bit more about the processes. So longshore drift is occurring, but how? And as well, what about all that material that uh, destructive waves have, um, have eroded? How's that being moved? It will be moved by traction. Traction coming from the Latin traho, which means to pull. Traction, so it's been, it's been pulled along the bottom of the ocean. Saltation, where rocks are bouncing, like some assault, saltation, like sort of bouncing, jumping along. Suspension, so if you've got small particles which are just floating in the water and they get washed along with the water. And at an even smaller level, solution, anything that's dissolved from corrosion will be too small to see with the naked eye, hence the uh, magnifying glass. And that is suspended, uh, sorry, dissolved, it is dissolved in the water and it's moved along that way. It's transported in those four ways, longshore drift being kind of a mixture of really these two, but kind of that one as well, possibly, um, until it gets deposited. Depositional landforms come about on two types of coast. Well, 
I say two types of coast. The coast um, can be split up into two types where there are depositional landforms. Swash aligned landforms, this is where the waves are coming in at 90 degrees and you get this sort of ridge at the back where it's not really moving in a longshore drift type way, it's just moving in like this. Or there are drift aligned coasts where you get uh, more longshore drift and you get these build up of sediments kind of in um, banks that build up especially on the edges where the waves are kind of pushing in. So you get these kind of thickened ends and thinner bits around the top. So swash aligned and drift aligned. The way in which deposition starts to occur is either gravity settling, so stuff just dropping out of the water when the water loses energy, it can't carry stuff anymore and it just drops it. But there's also, particularly for clays, get bits of clay which all stick together. It's called flocculation. Bits of clay stick together, they become larger, and then they fall out of the water. And these lead to a series of different landforms. So in terms of our depositional features, we've got spit, a bayhead beach, tombolo, a bar or barrier beach, and a cuspate foreland. A spit is where longshore drift carries on past a curve in the coast and basically just extends outwards and you get the sand building up and sometimes it comes out in a straight line and sometimes it hooks round and that creates what's called a recurved spit or hook bit easy to remember, depending on prevailing wind. Bayhead Beach is the beach that forms in a bay between two headlands. The wave energy is refracted, as mentioned in an earlier video, onto the headlands. Check that out if you don't remember it. And so the waves slow down and then deposit inside the bay. Tombolo connects a headland to an offshore island. You get a bar of sand that forms between the two, again from longshore drift. And similarly, a bar or a barrier beach does the same but between two, two headlands. So if there was another headland on from the spit, you get a bar forming. And you get a lagoon that forms behind it. Often the water is very, uh, very gentle, uh, quite warm. Uh, and you get, um, you do get some very different ecosystems that form. Finally, there's a cuspate foreland, which is a triangular projection from the land. We're not entirely sure how they form, but one suggestion is that it's two spits which have kind of run into each other from two different sets of longshore drift and extended outwards. Regardless, these are the deposition features um, that we get, the depositional landforms. Now it's worth mentioning at this point that the erosion and deposition, as we've said before, it's in dynamic equilibrium, but it's got to come from somewhere and go to somewhere else. So this here is the sediment cell idea. Now the suggestion about it being a cell is kind of misleading because it doesn't go round in a cell. It just stays within an area in general. Sediment will come from sources, Erosion, for example, or from rivers, various other processes, and make its way down to a sink. So it comes from a source to a sink. It'll move down and the sink will collect and the source will provide. It doesn't go back again, uh, not, certainly not in any um, time scale that we can understand. But it's worth bearing in mind that you have a start point and an end point and then if anything changes within that process of erosion, transportation and deposition, you're going to end up changing the dynamic equilibrium. As well as all the marine processes that we've looked at, there are also sub-aerial processes. The processes that occur on land and not related to the sea. These are generally based around weathering. 
Now, weathering is different to erosion in that weathering happens without um, anything moving. Weathering just happens where the rock is sat in place and stuff just happens to it. Erosion involves a process with like waves being thrown at it or wind or water or something. Weathering is just where it kind of, the rock just breaks down. The phrase that's used is in situ. And this can be mechanical, um, i.e. physical processes that cause the rock to break apart. Chemical, so rock being dissolved um, or corroded in different ways. And biological, through plants. As I mentioned in a previous video, how vegetation can actually break rocks apart. It's very much related to climate, how warm or cool it is um, over the long term, and also to the lithology. But the best uh, place to look is page 128 in your textbook. It's got a great table that explains all the processes. Key thing to remember though is it's happening in situ. There's no movement going on, it's just breaking apart. That's it. Now erosion is where movement is involved, generally from water, ice or wind. Surface runoff, so you've got a big storm washing away um, the sediment, the soils on top of the rocks. Fluvial and glacial processes, fluvial is rivers, glacial is glaciers. Ice and water act in a very, very similar way when it comes to erosion. Um, transportation and deposition. But the key thing is to realise they're occurring as well and they're washing that sediment down to the coast. And aeolian processes, the wind. Sediment can be blown around by the wind. Think sandstorms in the desert can also happen down on sand dunes. So there are these sub-aerial weathering and erosion processes going on, but check out page 128 for all the weathering processes. So when uh, subaerial processes have occurred, you can get what's known as mass movement. This is where large amounts of material move in a massive way, so a large mass of material moves. Makes sense, doesn't it, really? There are five types altogether. First one is a fall. So a rock fall, or something like that, where pieces of rock just drop off the cliff and they fall into a heap at the bottom. And this heap generally creates sort of a pyramid fan type shape, talus scree slope. So bits just drop off. Uh, you tend to get that with either, well, with a, basically with a horizontal dip. So without any dip, just straight horizontal dip and you've got rocks just dropping off. There's topple, which is where you've got a very, very steep seaward dip. So see over here, what happens is it's like books all stacked up against each other. But eventually, if one's undercut, it'll just topple over. So even though they're sort of stacked like that, eventually the layers will topple over and it'll peel apart. Kind of like a stack of books falling over. Now if you've got a very shallow seaweed dip, you get what's known as a translational slide. So rather than toppling over like this, these are just break off and slide down the slope. There's a mass movement of earth. Very, very dangerous that one because a large amount moves very quickly and it's very easy for it to move because it moves along the bedding planes of the rock so tend to be very, very dangerous. Moving on, you get rotational slides. Now rotational slides are where you've got a curved failure surface, i.e. where the rocks have failed and they've moved. And you get a large piece of material that slides down a hill slope. It can happen very quickly, it can happen very slowly. Sometimes it just moves a tiny bit and shifts down. Sometimes you get a huge slide. Water generally plays a part in this because it tends to be linked in some ways to unconsolidated clay. Clay is impermeable, 
but it's unconsolidated so it does tend to move. If you've got clay like this and then you've got a permeable material like chalk over the top, the chalk fills with water like a sponge but then it can't move past the clay. So the clay retains that water within the chalk, the chalk holds onto the water and the clay keeps it there and what happens is the clay gets waterlogged right at the boundary and it acts um, like a lubricant basically and it just slides down the hill. So anywhere with this chalk and unconsolidated clay together is at great risk. Funnily enough there are a lot of those on the coastlines. Just because of our geology we've got a lot of chalk and a lot of clay come together. So rotational slips, rotational slides are very very common and they're a big issue um, on many coastlines. Finally, this flows. If you've just got unconsolidated rock, particularly weak, um, if you've got very little holding it together, often again water, it'll just flow down basically like a liquid or a semi-liquid. It'll just slide down the hill slope and again it's a curved failure surface, it just looks like a mudslide basically. So there's the five types of mass movement. Which brings us to the end of the characteristic coastal landforms and how they link to coastal landscapes. There's a lot in the textbook about this, this has just been an overview really, so do go back over it. If you've got any questions let me know. Thanks for watching.